Hello everyone, um, I'm Johanna Kerbel and I'm from Axel Zeitlis Group at the University of Cambridge and I would like to talk about the stability of protein sugar lyophilisates investigated with turret spectroscopy. So I will start off with a bit of the background and methods, come to the results and then conclude what we found. If you think about drug molecules, you probably think about something like aspirin or ibuprofen, like common inflammatory, anti-inflammatory drugs that you've probably all taken before to get rid of a headache. So you take one or two tablets um, and, and everything's fine afterwards. However, for more complicated and rare diseases, it might not be enough to just swallow a tablet. So each year, the FDA approves loads of loads of drugs. Or more than half of the ones I'm showing here they're actually administered not as a tablet anymore, but via injection. I've highlighted two more here that are antibody drug conjugates. So they have, they're, they're much more complicated and the molecules are much bigger than the ones I've shown on the previous slide. When you inject a drug, that drug does obviously not come as a tablet. But the way it is prepared is that you have a solution of your drug and uh, your, your drug molecules and also some surrounding excipients that helps st stabilize it. Via a process called freeze drying or lyophilization, you remove the water and you're left over with the powder. And that powder can then be stored and shipped to hospital. Then you can add water again, solvate it, and then you can inject it to a patient. That powder that contains the drug and also the excipients that are used to make it more stable and to take the place of the water as it is removed. On one hand, it is very good because you can use those large molecules and give, give them to patients, but it also comes with some challenges, especially if it comes, if you want to predict or measure the stability of that powder compact. So now that is where the Terra spectroscopy comes in because the stability is actually related to molecular mobility. And the nice thing about Terra's time domain spectroscopy is, is that it measures vibrational dynamics which relate to that molecular mobility. So we can use Terra spectroscopy to learn something about the stability of our powdered lyophilized sample. And what we're looking at specifically is how the mobility of the matrix surrounding our drug molecule, a protein, changes and what, what the mobility of it is. And also how the surrounding matrix actually stabilizes the protein itself. And now I've mentioned protein and, and matrix and sugar. Um, so the samples we're looking at, they contain an IgG antibody and sucrose. So our IgG antibody is, is a very large protein and sucrose is just common sugar. And what we do is we vary the antibody content from zero, which would mean a pure sucrose sample, to 100%, which is a pure protein sample. And all the while, we keep the water content, the nominal water content, very, very low. We used a very, very high secondary drying temperature during the freeze drying to make sure that we remove almost all of the water, as much water as possible during the drying. So this is not commonly done in drug production, but it is done for the purpose of this study. We look at the sample using a TerraView TerraPulse 4000 spectrometer. We record both the reference and the sample, record the waveforms, and then we can calculate the absorption spectrum at each temperature. And we're varying the temperature between 80 and 400 Kelvin. And that leads directly to the results. As I've mentioned, we calculate the absorption coefficient at each temperature. On this slide, you can see the absorption spectra of both sucrose on the left and a sample containing 95% antibody and only 5% sucrose on the right. And on the first glance, they look very similar. And the only real difference is that last spectrum here at very high temperatures in the sucrose sample. And that is actually where the sucrose starts to crystallize. So we can see uh, a crystalline mode at around 1.3 terahertz here. But before that, the sucrose was amorphous and the sample containing so much antibody remains amorphous all the way through because the protein doesn't crystallize. But apart from that, there must be some more information in the spectra. And actually there is. And the way we're getting it out is that we're looking only at one frequency, for example, at one terahertz. And we can see and track how the absorption at that one frequency changes as we increase the temperature. And that leads directly onto the next slide, where I've plotted just that. I've plotted the absorption coefficient at all the different temperatures we measured. And as we can see is that as we increase the temperature, the absorption also steadily increases. And that figure looks very much alike for most 
almost or small molecules uh, that we've measured so far. And it's also true for all the samples in this study where we have less than 50% antibody. But again, we would like to get some more information out of this. And what we can see is that as the absorption increases with temperature, there's some certain there are certain regions where the increase is linear. And then there's certain crossover points that I've shown here um, between those linear regions. And at those crossover points that are labeled here, these are the so-called glass transition temperatures, Tg beta and Tg alpha. And it's also up here, the before mentioned crystallization temperature of the sucrose. So what you can see is that as you increase the temperature in the beginning, your absorption increases until you reach Tg beta. And that point, is if you increase the temperature even more, the absorption change is larger. And that is because at, at that certain glass transition point, the mobility in the sample is increased, you have more run translational rotational motions becoming available, changes in dihedral angles are possible. And that happens again at the so-called Tg alpha, the glass transition temperature that you can also measure with loads of other methods. Um, and that is also accompanied by a change in viscosity, for example. However, that is only true for, as I said before, the, the, the samples containing lots of small molecules and only a bit of protein. If you look at the sample containing only protein, the, the figure looks slightly different. What you can see here in blue is that as you increase the temperature, you've reached the Tg beta at around 220 Kelvin. That is expected. However, as you increase it further, instead of another increase in absorption, you actually reach a plateau. And that plateau means that as we increase the temperature, the absorption does not change anymore, or it might even decrease. And that was very interesting when we saw it and we wanted to find out more about it. As you increase the temperature even more, Again, at some point, you are again in a region where the absorption increases with temperature. This is all very interesting and we would like to understand why the plateau is happening and what's going on there. And to do that, we measured our samples with varying concentrations of antibody and sucrose. So what we're looking at here is a graph where I'm showing the crystallization temperature that I explained on the previous slides for different concentrations of antibody. So what we can see is that below 40% antibody, as you increase the, the concentration, your crystallization temperature actually also increases. And then if you increase the protein concentration even more, that means you decrease your sugar concentration. That also means that the crystallization it becomes less apparent you do not see any crystallization for sucrose concentrations of less than 25%, which explains why these points are missing and this one is a bit lower. However, to make it a bit more complicated, we also saw other transition temperatures. So if I plot the Tg alpha that we measured with thorough spectroscopy on the same graph, we see that below 40% antibody, it actually follows the trend of the crystallization temperature. So we have an increase in our Tg alpha as we increase the antibody concentration. However, at concentrations above 60%, actually there's a jump and the uh, Tg alpha is lower than it was before and only then increasing again. Um, and one more <laughs> set of data in this graph, and this is the, the red crosses here, is the DSC data on the same samples. And usually the Tg alpha that is measured with DSC and the Tg alpha that is measured with terahertz spectroscopy agree pretty well. In this case, however, below 40%, we have only a very, very slight increase in the transition temperature measured with, T with the DSC compared to the quite noticeable increase in the measured return spectroscopy. And again, above 60%, we have that jump. But now the Tg alpha measured with the DSC is actually higher than the one measured with uh, spectroscopy. One way we could explain that, or we can try to explain that, is by invoking a model called the potential energy landscape. So the potential energy landscape you can think of as having several wells where your molecule is, is trapped in. And as you increase the temperature, you actually fill up those wells. And if 
your energy is high enough, your temperature is high enough, your, your sample can access not only one well, but the neighboring well as well, because it can jump over that barrier. And if that happens, your sample has more potential confirmations. So it can access more confirmational states, it can move more. And by moving more, the dipole moment changes more. And we're measuring that. We're measuring with terror spectroscopy the change of the dipole moment. If you think about it that way, what that means is that by varying the temperature and measuring the, the sample absorption with terror spectroscopy, we can track the shape of these potential energy landscape. And we can relate actually the shape of it to the change of rate of absorption change. That means the more the absorption changes with temperature, the more states become available. And that actually means that the potential energy landscape must be very shallow. We must have many small, small wells so that a small change in temperature gives us access to a high number of other confirmations. And if we keep that in mind, we can actually look at that graph where I've plotted on the right hand side the absorption change with temperature. And we can plot that for a range of different antibody concentrations. And what we can see here is actually that it seems like there is a minimum change of absorption with temperature at intermediary concentrations, so about 50% antibody, 50% sucrose. And now, if we think back on the potential energy surface model, that could actually mean that at those concentrations, we put in energy, but we actually don't get much change in the motions that are available. So that actually could mean that the stability of a sample is increased at those intermediary concentrations. And that leads directly onto that the protein can actually be locked or is actually locked into a confined state. So if we think back to the very beginning, one of the first figures I showed was the increase in absorption with temperature. And in small molecular drugs, we get that steady increase to transition temperatures, and all the while the absorption increases. However, if we have a lot of antibody in there, we get a plateau. And at that plateau, what we're thinking what actually happens is that the protein is jammed. It is physically locked into a confirmation and it can't get out of it unless we put a lot of energy in. And while it is there, we don't have any new motions becoming available. We're trapped in that confirmation and that energy well. The mo molecular mobility cannot increase further, even as we increase the temperature. Only if we increase it quite a bit, we can jump out of that well into another well, which means that other dihedral angles are possible, other motions are possible, other confirmations are possible, and in that case, the protein can move again and it is no longer jammed. The experiments have shown that this process is associated with the macromolecular structure of the protein itself. And we can say that because we've measured all the samples containing sucrose and we've measured samples containing a bit of sucrose and we've measured samples containing only the protein. And we do see the jamming and the plateau in samples containing sucrose, but we also see it in samples containing only the antibody. So we can see that this jamming depends only on the antibody and not on the sucrose. And we also can say that it doesn't depend on the presence of water because we control the experiments and the samples so well that we are very sure that there's almost no water in them at all. So the jamming really depends on the protein jamming itself and not with the sucrose. So terahertz spectroscopy is a measure of mobility, which is very useful because we can use it to infer stability. In amorphous systems, in very simple amorphous systems, like pure sucrose, the molecular mobility changes at the two glass transition temperatures. And as we increase the amount of protein in the samples, we shift the, these transitions to higher temperatures. At about 50% antibody, 50% sucrose, we have the least absorption change with temperature and we think that that relates to an increase in stability. But as we increase the antibody content even further, we do not see that shape anymore with the two transition temperatures. Our spectra and, our, and, and the absorption change with temperature is clearly dominated by the antibody. We see that plateau, we see that jamming, and the sucrose merely acts as a void filler. And with that, I would like to change everyone involved in the project, especially Mauds and Yvonne, um, and my group, and also the funding bodies you can see on the slides. And with that, I'd like to thank you. And if you have any questions, please let me know. Thanks.